Hi, I'm Dan Clancy. I'm the engineering director for Google Book Search. Uh, some of y'all I know from my previous life where I used to be at NASA where I ran the Information Sciences Directorate. And I'm going to give you like four talks today in one. So I'm going to try to jump through this. And part of this is, um, you know, feel free to start asking me questions because, again, there are like 12 directions that I can go in this. And um, I'm going to try to kind of touch on a number of things. Okay. So I'm just going to start. I assume, a quick question, how many of you have used Book Search? Okay. So I was going to assume that you all pretty much know um, uh, what's happening there. So I'm going to just give the requisite couple minute kind of background to make sure we're all on the same page. So we all know that we started this project really because there's this vast amount of information that's not accessible. Larry and Sergey had a deep, deep belief, which I share, that information um, retrieval and search has really transformed the way we interact with information. But the bulk of uh, our cultural and historical um, heritage actually was not accessible in the internet. So let's digitize it all. Let's make it all searchable. Um, got books from two sources. We get books from publishers. Uh, that's what you see a lot on there, where we actually get copyrighted works. We get permission. And you can preview up to 20% of the works, um, uh, sometimes more. Uh, we get books from libraries. For the public domain books, we let you see the entire thing. We give it away for free, PDF download, et cetera, et cetera. Um, for the in-copyright, we only show three snippets because um, uh, we believe it's fair use to scan and index um, and have snippets. Um, so that's the – let me just think. I think this now goes to – doesn't go to lawsuit yet. But um, uh, So that's the subject of the lawsuit, little thing. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the settlement. Um, first, I'm going to talk some about the challenge of how to find books and how we integrate books into Google, okay, and break down how we think about it. So broadly, I think of queries in the following different ways, what I'll call an information query. Usually with an information query, the result is some content match, okay, where really without the content, you couldn't have matched that, okay. So an example might be page rank algorithm. There's somewhere in some book on page 178 something that describes the page rank algorithm. So that's what I call a content match, and that's where we usually blend stuff into Google. So it's just like a web page, no difference. Okay? Another class of match is um, you know, what I'll call topical. I'm looking for something on this subject, and there are a number of books that might be relevant on this subject. So information retrieval, an example of a topical, you don't want to land in the middle of a book. Now, of course, there are interesting interplays here, because for some topics, there may be good chapters, which are parts of a book. Right? You can have a good summary chapter on information retrieval, and that's actually a great result sometimes. In fact, it may even be better than the whole textbook. Okay? Then you have navigational, and sometimes navigational are author navigational or, or title navigational, where you want to be able to find a specific um, book. Okay? Each of those we handle a little differently. One comment I'll say that as you think of these things, you know, remember that often the, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the search challenges, you don't just want to take the text that is on the book. That, in fact, for title, you know, if you're looking for Bill Clinton's autobiography, you might not know it's called My Life, but you may search on Bill Clinton's autobiography. That's still a navigational query. So the way we present this is we present it differently depending upon the type of query. Where we've seen the biggest benefit and where the focus of the project really was on was predominantly on the information content. There are lots of ways that if you know what book you want where you can find that book. But we found a lot of serendipitous discovery from the fact that we didn't text the whole book. So I'm going to talk about this a little later when I talk technically about some stuff. Um, one thing I wanted to um, uh, let you all aware that in terms of the value of uncovering all this information, the data here is actually about a year old. I haven't rerun it yet, so I th and I think it's actually a little lower now. But what this is showing is that this is over a 30-day period. The and this one is the number of the number of viewer books, public domain books, which is this line, where users have seen at least 10 pages. Okay, and it's 50% of our public domain books. At least 10 pages are viewed every month. Okay? For our partner program books, it's over 80%. Okay? What this is a demonstration of is really the value of serendipitous discovery from um, full text search and just integrating it into Google. Because for much of this stuff, people may not have checked it out from the library for years. In fact, at Harvard, none of the pages had even been cut. So we know nobody ever read that book. So, you know, in kind of these questions of the long tail, there are just countless examples where people find stuff, and I'm not going to go through all the testimonials, where people find something about their grandfather 
where all they knew was he was in World War I, and here they find a book that explains the division and the infantry he was on, and their blah, 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 now they know all this about their grandfather that they never would have known. And those examples just go on and on. So I really think it's a demonstration about the value of long tail search, serendipitous discovery. And I think there's still a lot of not so much computer science research. I keep trying to get a lot of the library science folks. I think there's a lot of interesting research about finding how the internet and full text search helps this stuff much more so than where it had been before. You know, in other words, and how much more usage do we see of this stuff? I think there's good longitudinal research that's interesting to do. So now part of the thing I'm going to talk a little bit about is our scanning. Okay, and now this in and of itself can be five talks. Okay, and um, I'm not going to go in and show all sorts of all the details, but I'm going to give you a little bit of background in terms of how we approach to this problem. And I'm going to talk maybe a little more than some of y'all have heard us talk publicly before. Um, so we approach this problem in much the same way that we approach our large scale deployments of our of our serving centers. It's really kind of saying let's. Let's take into account that there'll be errors, and then let's write soft, smart software and also use people to find those errors and account for those errors. And the analogy I like to make in terms of our approach to scanning, and this group will understand it well, is a comparison of um, progressive JPEG versus what used to happen where the JPEG image would just slowly inch up the screen. And the way scanning used to occur was you know, you would scan a tiny bit and you'd make absolutely sure it was true, it was right. But we, would, we were walking in tiny, tiny steps. And really the way we approached the, um, the mass digitization issue is saying, how can you do this at scale, accept that there are problems, and so that when you consider over time the quality of the corpus, that it really fills in in terms of the quality of what you get. And where you can invest your resources proportional in some fashion to the usage that that's going to receive. So there's certain books where you should spend $100 to scan, and some books where you, maybe you should spend $15 to scan, and we shouldn't just act like everything's the same. Okay. So the way we do this is sort of with these pro progressive circles here. Okay. So um, I'm not going to go through the logistics. Obviously, we developed our own scanning technology. Um, I've actually, I know Larry was here earlier. If you all see him at any of the um, uh, uh, receptions, you can go tell him, Larry, why don't you let them talk about their book scan more? Because <laughs> okay? actually the patent is out, and I, I tried to push her, but you know, I said, look, Larry, the patent's out. Okay, It's not like it's a secret anymore. So if you want to figure out how we do the scanning, go read the patent. Okay? <laughs> um, but this is a little bit broader in scope in terms of what we're thinking. So part of it is the actual scanning. And there's one thing, which is how good is your your picture that you're acquiring, okay? Then we do a ton of processing after the scanning, okay? We have to de-warp the image. We have to clean the image. We do OCR, so there is a lot, you know, there's a significant amount when you look at the computational resources required to do all the processing, it's a lot. Now, part of our approach to this was saying, we can keep making our, our software smarter and reprocess all the image. So we've actually reprocessed all of our books. I think we're going on it the second time now. Okay, and we're going to do it again in a year because we've made our processing software smarter. And so many of the problems that people might see are actually software problems that we can fix. Okay, now this comes, the thing you have to be able to do is when you take the actual picture, say, is this a good picture? So we actually have some, what I call, it's not really real-time QA in terms of real-time systems, but it's kind of while we're scanning the book, we have some degree of automated detectors to try to figure out if an error has occurred. And we do have humans turning the pages. Everyone knows that from seeing the hands. Um, uh, so we have ways to say, did they make a mistake? And then possibly get them to turn back if they did. Okay, so that while the book is still there, we fix it. Okay, but that's not perfect. Okay, sometimes it screws up. Now we have the processing and storage. Now, in our processing, sometimes it's our processing software that screws up. Okay, sometimes it's the scanning that screwed up. So there's a time lag here between when we realize there's a problem here versus when we realize there's a problem there, okay? And part of this allows us, if we think it's an acquisition problem, where we still have that book and we can scan it again before we return the book, okay? Um, so a lot of our books we scanned twice, okay? Because if somebody made a mistake the first time, we scan it again. Now you still have the challenge of putting those two scans together to create 
a combined product, which is itself a very challenging problem, um, especially if you have multiple pages within each scan, because you not only need to detect that there's an error, which can be very challenging, you know, but then you also need to pick which is the right page and what's the right order of the page. So that's where we spent a lot of time. And in this, we always take this kind of combined automated human approach where we have a robust QA process where we can ask humans simple questions so that we don't think of the world as it's all software or it's all people. The way we've brought the costs down is saying, let software be as smart as you can. And one of the mistakes that I think we made early on, and for other folks doing this, I'll, I, I encourage you to think this, is we, we overestimated how smart we could make the software. So in fact, what happened was, as opposed to the quality of what you see being constant and the cost going down as our software got smarter, the cost remained constant and the quality was the thing that suffered, okay? And then over time, the quality came up, okay? And later on, we sort of rethought this and realized, hey, maybe the, the right way to approach that is a little different. You know, in other words, don't assume, let your software get smarter and make it so it's cheaper. Don't always assume that you can write as smart a software that you're always going to overestimate how smart you think you are in terms of the software you can write. So lean on humans a little bit earlier more than not. Now, so we have another stage at the QA here. And then really the big thing is, as people use this stuff, well, well now that's the glory, that we don't have to look at every single page to detect every single error, because people will look at this and we can get humans that are using it to tell us where there's an error. And then we can feed back, and sometimes we may have a better scan of that page. Sometimes we may need to scan that page again. So again, it's sort of approaching this combined human automation along with different time cycles in terms of the feedback loops so that when you look over a five-year period, the question is, where is the quality that you end up on 30 or 40 or 50 million books? And not how quickly do I, where is the quality on a small subset at this point in time? which is for the, one of the things I find very interesting in working with a lot of people from the libraries is while they've preserved these books for decades or centuries, they also are a very impatient lot. And so trying to get them to realize that it all doesn't happen right away um, has been fun. Um, so now I'm going to talk about another big challenge that we're facing. So we spend a lot of effort on OCR. Um, so we right now OCR over 100 languages, um, uh, all Greek, Roman, Cyrillic. Um, we now do Thai, Fractor. Um, we've launched Arabic, um, so we've invested a lot. We have a, an OCR team, and we also license software. The project that we're really emphasizing a lot now is automated structure extraction, which there's been a lot of good work on, luckily, Park and other places. Um, but really the kind of grand challenge that I think is in front of us is the way I like to describe it is, suppose someone gave you an XML version of a book today, and then they gave you the same book to scan. Can you scan that book? and transform that book so that it's an equivalent object as the XML thing that they gave you. And if you really want to make the books that have been published over the last 200 years as vibrant in a digital economy as the books published today, they need to be robust digital objects because you can't just be dealing with page images. Okay? Um, and so there's lots of issues here, obviously, in terms of extracting you know, uh, structure and captions and images. Mathematics equations is a great thing. Right, that right now we just say, oh, this is an image and take it as an image. But there's all sorts of interesting challenges about, you know, how to actually extract the structure of the mathematical equation. But and I don't think, and I'm going to come to this in a second, this isn't just a Google thing. I think, you know, broadly, you know, this is, there are tons of nice research challenges here that I think um, uh, people can dig their hands into. So I'm going to touch base, because I want you all to be aware of this as we talk about some of the research. Another thing we're doing is digitizing old newspapers which again offers a host of um, research challenges. We're doing it from the microfilm. Okay, so this is the Google News Archive search. Um, one of the big challenges in newspapers, which I find particular, which I don't know what the answer is, so I'll throw this out so that people can be you know, thinking through it. For books, it's pretty straightforward how to, I think, mine the value of that because a book, as you think through a newspaper, a magazine, and a book, Newspapers tell you what's happening right now. There's not much of synthesis over time. But for someone who's deeply researching, that's really useful. Magazines, a little more synthesis. Books, even more synthesis. Okay? So when you're looking for certain things, you'd prefer the Wikipedia article, which gives you a nice synthesis. 
But really what's in the newspaper is actually a chronicle of what's happened across the world in terms of daily life and also perspectives that people had on events at different points in time. Okay, so I think there's lots of interesting social research that moves beyond just how we look back on what happened, but actually how people viewed the work as they're going on, okay? There's also tons of interesting research in terms of how to parse the newspaper, um, how to clean the paper. Some of these things are total crap, so this is some of the cleaning that um, we've done on this. Um, and so I wanted to mention, uh, again, part of this is, is in terms of corpuses, you know, one thing I'm going to talk to you about is some the, what the settlement allows. But as people have research ideas that can build upon some of this, I can't tell you, yes, we'll give you everything right now. But I'd, I'd like to hear the ideas, and let's see where we can kind of act as a resource for some of the ideas that people might have in this area. So now what I'm going to do is take very quickly give you an overview of the settlement agreement, and then I'm going to talk about one part of it that I think is important to this group, which is the, the research corpus. Um, so... In the agreement, and this is settling two lawsuits, it's a class action settlement, um, and um, uh, as that, the class is basically, in fact, many of you are class members. How many of you are authors? Okay. How many of you have out-of-print books? Okay. How many of you know whether or not you own the rights to your out-of-print books? Okay. <laughs> Probably many of you said, I don't know. Okay. Um, uh, so part of the, the way the settlement works is... Um, for any in-print book, all we can do is scan an index, and we can't show any content unless the rights holder comes forward and says you can show content. For out-of-print books, we can scan an index, and there are a number of access models we start making by default. Okay, I'll talk about them in a second. And part of it is designed where rights holders always have choice. So they can opt out of the settlement, which says I don't want to be part of it. They can remove their book from the settlement, which says I don't want you to scan, scan at Google, so they stay in the settlement but they tell us not to scan it and that's legally binding and we can't scan it. And if we've already scanned it, we have to delete it. Or more importantly, they can turn on and off the different models at any point in time. They can pull it out, they can put it back in, lots of, lots of flexibility in terms of um, what they're doing. So in fact, you don't have to stay with Google. There's no, oh, if you don't do it by this date, you know, uh, you, you've missed the boat, okay? With the out of print stuff, by default, we're gonna start making access. Um, the, the services are um, a consumer purchase, ability for users to buy it, um, uh, preview, ability for users to preview up to 20% to determine if they want to buy it. And when I say consumer purchase, what they're buying is electronic access to the book in the cloud. Okay, it'll be there five years, 10 years, and they can always get it when they're online. Um, so preview, see up to 20% of the book for free and to decide if you want to purchase it. And then an institutional subscription, the ability to license to universities and colleges and whatnot. Um, rights holders are supposed to come forward and claim their books. Since many of you are class members, I'm not communicating to you as class members. You're represented by counsel, blah, blah, blah. Um, but note, you should go and claim your books even if they're in print because you still have rights and you should be aware of what those rights. And the, the URL is, I think, googlebooksettlement.com. If you just search on Bing, for Google Book Settlement, I'm sure you'll find it. <laughs> um, so, uh, so in terms of the access models, um, uh, any money that's collected is given to this group called the Books Rights Registry, which is independent from Google, and it's run by authors and publishers, and uh, uh, they're supposed to hold the money on behalf of the rights holder and try to find the rights holder for books that have not been claimed. And so over time, what you'll do is see them more and more finding out who are the rights rights holders. The database they build of what books have been claimed and who claimed the books has to be public. So that means one of the big questions is, is does this give you a monopoly on all this stuff? Well, the, as people come forward, if they want the registry to represent them, the registry can, in fact, will. And the information about who are the rights holder has to be public. So people don't have to work with the registry. They can just go right to the rights holder. Okay? So that's a very quick outline of the settlement. Um, for those of you that are interested, actually, there is an event tonight at the Computer History Museum, um, which is just... You could feel free, and I assume there's some event with this as well, but the Computer History Museum is just right down the road, and that's a good forum to kind of hear about that. But that wasn't what I wanted to focus on. Um, uh, here. So what I want to focus on, so there are two things that I want to focus on, um, and I'm going to take, go off the settlement for a second. One of the challenges we've run in in the settlement is 
people think that that's our vision for the future of how books will be bought and sold, and it's actually not. It's our vision for what to do with all these out-of-print books, which is not the future of the book market. Okay? The future of the book market are the in-print books and the books that are yet to be published. Okay? So one of the things we're developing here is we're trying to figure out what's the right role for Google, because this isn't our core business. But it just so happens we've scanned millions of books. Okay? Um, and in particular, we want to know how can we engage in this market in a manner that keeps it kind of more competitive and more open. So our strategy is we're going to have a heavily focus on retail syndication so that you should be able to buy books from anywhere. Okay? They'll be stored in the cloud, um, uh, and then you should be able to read them on any device. So if you buy a Sony reader, if you buy your laptop, if you buy your whatever, okay? For those people using general purpose devices, we're going to rely heavily on HTML or, and or Google Gears, and the browser is really going to be the app, that we're going to center this heavily around the browser as opposed to dedicated clients and kind of work to make sure that the security works there because we think from a user perspective, you, sh you don't want to be loading this app or this app. Really, the browser is becoming the app, and you should be able to access it from any device that's a computing device that has a browser, and it should be the same. So it's very much trying to focus on how can the browser be the app, what can you do with HTML5 offline capabilities, um, and also then how to support other reading devices. Okay. Um, so, and I think for those of you, this isn't a computer science question per se, but I think there are a lot of interesting questions, and y'all can feel free to grab me. I think I should be able to make the reception later about what happens with copyrighted content in the cloud, and how do you deal with this? Come your expectance of the dependence on the cloud, and also the challenges of how to make sure the cloud doesn't lead to one dominant player, which is one reason why we're focusing a lot on retail syndication, and I'm not going to go through this. We're doing some other things to make sure the clouds can interoperate because we think it really needs to be um, um, open. Now what I'm going to talk about is one important part of the settlement agreement, in particular with this audience. So one of the things that the settlement agreement does is it gives us the right with our library partners to create two what are called research corpuses. And they're really research centers, okay? And what this is is we're taking all of the books we've scanned, and our library partners can make up to two centers that will have all of these books for research, okay? Now, today, one of the problems that we have is since many of these books are copyrighted and we don't have authorization, so Google currently, we've scanned over 10 million books, okay? All sorts of research you can do on 10 million books. I can't let most of you ask, I can't give you those 10 million books because to the extent I give you the books, some copyright holder might sue me and you, and to the extent that somehow gets out, then we've got all sorts of problems, okay? So in here, this is actually a fully, if the settlement is approved, okay, we get full authorization from the copyright holders, the class, to give all these books to create two research centers, okay? For what is called, and I apologize, I'm the one who made up this name, and I still haven't come up with a better name. If any of you can come up with a better name, please tell me. Um, in the settlement agreement, it's called non-consumptive research. And it doesn't mean it doesn't have a disease, okay? It's trying to capture the idea that these, this is not for reading all the books, which is the idea of consuming the intellectual content for which the book was written. But rather, it's for computational analysis and other large-scale analysis over the whole corpus, okay? And so it basically, there's kind of clear authorization for people to do anything that's called non-consumptive, and it has a definition in there. If your goal is, I, I really want to read John Grisham's latest book, that's not non-consumptive research, okay? But there's countless other things that people will want to do, okay? So it really ranges quite diversely. So certainly new search technology is a huge area of non-consumptive research, okay? Um, uh, linguistic analysis, image analysis, information extraction, um, uh, better OCR, better um, automated translation, because we, we have a, you know, a, a huge parallel corpus here because there are lots of books that have been translated into multiple languages, and now you have the text of these books. So this is just scratching, you know, scratching the surface of the type of research that can be done on, this, um, on these resources, okay? And the way it works is our library partners, of which now there are 30 that I expect will eventually become partners, they all are responsible for building these centers. We're putting up $5 million for them to build the centers, but it's their jobs to do this. It was really important. A lot of times they said, Google, why don't you do it? Although one of the challenges is you're talking about doing lots of research that, in fact, may be competing with Google, 
Okay, saying you have to come and do it on a comp Google computer, you know, even though we might say, oh, but we promise we won't look. I mean, at some level, there's some apprehension if you say, yes, you do all your research on my computer. Okay, and I thought it was important to make sure this was um, independent in terms of Google than in terms of running these things. Okay, um, and any of the IP is, of course, retained to be yours, blah, blah, blah. Okay, that, and, and Google is not involved in deciding who gets to access this. The universities, I say libraries, but it's really the universities. I suspect since of the 30 university, which is, includes all the UC schools, CIC, Michigan, um, Stanford, Princeton, Cornell, Columbia, if they all came on, I suspect many of you are professors at those schools. And in fact, we are also talking to many other schools and we're very interested in adding other partners. So I suspect for almost everyone in this room, there's a reasonable chance that your, your university could be, would be a partner and you can be part of trying to figure out how this is run. Um, and anyone else can still access it, but it's just their responsibility to figure out the deals with the universities, to figure out how people access it, okay? Um, uh, now, let me, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk through a few examples of research that either we have done or other people have done, and then I'm gonna talk through what I think are some of the research problems that face us, okay? And this is just to get you thinking of some of the different things that you can do. Um, so this is something that we have in book search today. It's called popular passages, okay? And in here, this was done by Okan Kalik and, um, uh, and Bill Shillett. And the problem they said they, they wanted to look at was let's figure out those sort of seminal or popular passages that actually are referred to a lot in this corpus. Now, if you already know what those popular things are, it's easy. It's just search. The problem is you don't know what actually is the things that happen over and over again. And one of the challenges you have to distinguish between strings that are actually important quotes and seminal and strings that just happen either due to serendipity or due to things that aren't really that important. You know, so I'll be back is everywhere. That's not a popular passage, okay? Um, and there's also, you're doing this in the face of OCR errors and misquotations, because in fact, people frequently misquote these popular passages. And so this is part, one way to think of this, and, and this is, I will put this in the context of what I think, if I had to characterize what is one of the grand challenges, okay? One of the grand challenges, and this is gonna touch on search and many other things, is we all know that on today's web, there are all sorts of things we can do because of the rich hyperlinking structure that exists between all of the documents, okay? And in fact, in search, it, you know, people have been slaving away at search for a long time, and most people think, oh, search doesn't work very well. The World Wide Web came along. Suddenly, oh, Google solved search. Okay, of course it hasn't. But of course, part of the thing is, is that people in this room realize, but many other people don't realize, is that one reason it works so well is because you have fairly short documents along with rich metadata from people creating links and hyperlinks all over the place and now it becomes much easier than what information retrieval had been doing for many years when it just had the documents okay so these books are not there are all sorts of implicit links in all these books both within the books and within the web okay some of them are more explicit than others obviously a citation is a link it's explicit in a text, but there isn't a hyperlink, okay? There are all sorts of quotes and references and all sorts of other things that really are connecting these books together. So the question is, in a world 10 years from now, 20 years from now, how do all these books just kind of disappear into what I will call is the rich fabric of information that is the World Wide Web, okay? Some of this is through automated techniques, right? So this is an example of a set of relationships between these books. They may be strong, they may be weak, but it's defining relationships that exist between these books because of these seminal passages. They're talking about the same thing, okay? Um, some other things actually may be humans making these links. In fact, one of the things that we've launched in our public domain stuff that has gotten very little use, and I think it's because the tool doesn't quite work yet very well, we have this clipping facility so that you can actually identify a portion of a page and clip and put it in your blog and get a link that goes not just to the book, but to a region of the page. So you can imagine hyperlinking into and out of books 
okay? Just like you do anything else on the web, okay? Now, one of the interesting questions, I think, as you think about not just hyperlinking into and out of books, let's take the example of an annotation, okay? An annotation, while it, an annotation is just basically identifying something with some comment on top of it, it doesn't actually have a link to another thing, right? And all a hyperlink is is an annotated relationship between two objects. But as you annotate a book, you would like those annotations to be persistent across different copies of a book and different versions of a book. So you should be able to annotate Tom Sawyer. And while sometimes you might be annotating a specific edition of Tom Sawyer, you're probably annotating Tom Sawyer as a, con as, as a literary work. And it should be that your annotations of the research that you're doing should be applied to anything, any version of Tom Sawyer, not just the version that I'm looking at. So as you think of a way to create these, these hyperlinks, this is one thing we've run into because we rescan books, we rescan pages, we have different copies of books, we have different, just having a persistent link that says, oh, you're looking at this page at this XYZ coordinate, this XY coordinate is actually not a very robust um, characterization of what this comment and what this link and what this thing is about. Okay, and so that's an example of one of the, you know, that I think is really an interesting problem of how do you create this kind of meta linking. And it also relates, I think, in the World Wide Web, because here this is a case where somebody creating the linking doesn't own the page. They don't own the book. Of course, the same thing happens on the web where you want to be making comments and all that. And sometimes they may be going out. Sometimes they may be going different directions where you don't own the, the document. Okay, and in fact, that document, may, we, we think you, these things have some degree of persistence, but we know will often morph and move in different places. So how do some of these things become persistent? Um, so another area, so this is actually work done by Arez Lieberman, Yuan Shen, and uh, Jean-Baptiste Michel at Harvard. And they haven't published this work yet. But, um, uh, and this is something that we're probably going to release sometime next year, an n-gram corpus, um, a five-gram corpus over all the books. Okay, and so those of you that are interested in this type, you know, come contact me. So um, they were working on this five-gram corpus, and so this is just one tiny example of some of the stuff they're doing is this is actually looking at how isms have grown and shrunk over time over this corpus, okay? There are countless other things that they've looked that because of these books, they're able to characterize how things have evolved over time. This is an area where I actually find, in particular with newspapers, you could do all sorts of interesting work, because there you get geographic and daily variation. And so you can see how people view things in the Deep South versus the Northeast versus et cetera, et cetera. OK? Um, uh, so another thing, they, we can pick up historical epidemics. This is an example where they kind of can pick up the various different flu epidemics from the book's corpus, from looking at the occurrence of um, influenza and then HIV. Okay, so there's a lot that we can find, and this is fairly simple analysis, okay? So in the linguistic analysis, I think there's a whole bunch of stuff to do. So this is, and I made this table an hour and a half ago when I was like, oh, let me just make at least one table so I'm not waving my hands for this. Um, in the research corpus, one of the challenges, and, and I'll say this, and this is why, especially for those of you in the computer science department, from some of the schools that are partners. One of the challenges, the negotiation over the ability to create this corpus was with the libraries. The challenge is I don't think the libraries fully understand what it means to build such a thing, okay? Because this is really a computing research center, okay? Not dissimilar from other computing research centers that um, you know, NSF and other folks have funded, okay? And thinking about how do you control access, how do you control cycles. When we give all these books, which when they include the images, you're offering talking about 10, 20 petabytes, that actually the computer they're building is a supercomputer in terms of the number of cycles. And that in fact, you often are gonna need robust cycles to go hand in hand with the data to effectively use this. Okay, so there are a lot of you know, research questions about how to build such a facility. Um, and they're not all, re I, think, I think actually people know how to do this. It's just getting the right people that know how to do it. And so, Conceptually, and this is my idea of what it might look like, you know, obviously you're going to have certain services that are important for computing at scale. And as I know, many of you will know, and I'm sure they're talking about it, you know, we've done some of this work 
um, uh, already and Hadoop and some of the other open source versions so that you can do MapReduce, you can do Bigtable and many of the other things. A big part is how do you store the books? So in fact, we spent a lot of time figuring out how, what are the underlying data structures we use so that it's easy to do a MapReduce over every single page and every single word of every single book. And if you don't store it right, that can be a ridiculously expensive operation. Okay, so when you build this underlying data layer about how to access, you really need to start with some understanding of the type of uses you're gonna to wanna to make of it so that you structure it in a manner that it will be efficient, okay? Now, my view of this research center is that ultimately there'll be lots of different types of people using it, okay? There'll be computer scientists that'll be working heavily, deeply within the data layer. But then there may be humanists and linguists and other folks that may not have those skills so I think of this as its own sort of open source world, where hopefully what researchers do is they come to work, they leave much of their code, they build services and applications that other types of researchers, so in fact, you might, you might have a computer scientist working with a historian, and they're gonna build, if we take, for example, this n-gram model, this is an example of a derived data product, okay? That in fact, you know, there was processing of this, and you get an n-gram model, and you'd like that n-gram model to reside within here, okay? And then you could imagine a search front end on the n-gram model so that people with really no computer science skills whatsoever can sit here and think of all sorts of different words and different combinations and get different graphs and reports, okay? So one of the big questions is how is this gonna operate as sort of an open source world where people, as they come and use it, can build upon each other's research, okay? Um, and the other thing is, luckily, the agreement allows lots of exporting of information, including, of course, all research publications, products are all owned by the person doing the research. It also allows data to be extracted and distributed more broadly, as long as it's not like competing with something Google's doing or, or something that one of the publishers is doing. So if you wanted to take out an index of all the world's books to make a competing product to Google Book Search, well, that might be a problem. But 99.9% .9 of what people will do, there's a fair amount of flexibility in terms of distributing stuff. Um, so now I'm gonna transition to where we can ask some questions, and I'm just gonna highlight what I think are some of the kind of research questions and opportunities that exist. One, what I talked about, seamless integration with the web. I think there's all sorts of stuff to do there. Um, so I'm gonna tie this to uh, somewhere in here, I don't know if it talks about search. Um, over search, I think there's a lot of work in search over dense textual content. And one of the things to think of is, what is the granularity and how do you segment and how do you parse the documents that are in here? Some books, chapters are really unique objects and first order objects. Some books, they're just kind of arbitrary separations, okay? Um, so you need to treat those things differently. Sometimes you wanna do deep segmentation into different semantic chunks, sometimes you don't. Okay, and this goes exactly to, since we don't have the rich hyperlinking structure that the web has, how do you infer some of the other uh, meta choices, you know, meta relationships and semantic information that exists between these things? So I think in terms of search, it's a very interesting corpus. Um, uh, OCR, if we wanna go from this, um, you know, scanned book to a robust XML, part of it is actually perfect OCR and OCR correction. Part of it is structure extraction. Um, segmentation, disaggregation of books, talked about that. Um, linguistic analysis, information extraction and linking, I think I've touched on uh, many of that. All right, so with that, um, oh, I don't need to talk through this, let's go through. So questions, and it can be either about the settlement, it can be about book search, it can be about the research, it can be about any of them. Okay. Are you considering or doing a similar project for sheet music. Ah, um, uh, so now you've gotten onto actually, I, I always I, I always wonder if managers get 20% time. Because in fact, we are actually, sheet music sometimes are part of these libraries, okay? So we scanned sheet music, okay? We don't do anything special with it, okay? The settlement doesn't cover sheet music, okay? I'll just tell you my own personal things, although I haven't had the time to find engineers with 20% project, as someone who plays the piano some, I actually think that if someone goes and just scans it and segments all the sheet music, and people could go online and buy it for $1.99, it would be kind of the same thing with iTunes as um, with music, because right now what people do is they go on and they get the tab, 
you know, stuff that people have put on there, it's generally pretty crappy. And that's because they only sell the stuff sometimes in these big books. And you can't buy individual songs, and the big book is $15. So I actually would love to kind of do a project where you actually segment, you have songs, and you basically make an iTunes for sheet music. Um, but I haven't made, it hasn't been at the top of the priority stack. So if you have any of your students who want to come over and start getting everyone else, talk to me, because uh, I would love to kind of talk to some of the sheet musics and do that. And part of the platform we've built makes it fairly easy to do that. Okay, so we have the underlying platform. It's just, you know, some of the work to do. Yeah, I, I noticed in your diagrams that there were outgoing arrows, but not incoming mm -hmm. arrows. Oh. So you seem to assume a uh, you know, immovable database? Or... No, no, no. So, so they're, they're outgoing. That's just, again, I did it an hour ago. Um, uh, it is the fact that this is copyrighted material. And for the public domain stuff, we should talk about how, uh, you know, we do have certain requirements about protecting it. So you can't, again, this will have all in-print books. You can't take all the books and say, I just want to run it over on my computer. And trust me, I'm not going to do anything bad. You know, the universities have to think about how to protect the content because to the extent this is a leaky sieve, then we have problems with sustaining the resource for research. And so there's this balance. So certainly there'd be lots of incoming arrows because other people should be adding stuff to the research center. It shouldn't just be about books we've scanned. And in fact, much of the stuff that doesn't have the protection it's it's very different, but but um, you know that's one of the challenges that the libraries need to yeah, address. Yeah, the equivalent of hyperlinks that you're using so effectively. Yeah, yeah, that you should be able. To, and in fact, general environment. Yes, yes, agree completely. And let's. I think he has a question back there, so we should. So when you talk about this uh, non-consumptive research, have you been thinking of any way of implementing? the interface in such a way that it can only be accessed for non consumptive research. So it doesn't yeah. have to be controlled by the agreement, but it will be the user interface that yeah. will allow you only this type of access. Yeah, so, so I think, and again, I, I have thought, ultimately the universities that run it have to think about this. I know I've thought about it where I think the agreement is, I think as opposed to creating a hard lock, so there is no way you can do it, what you do is, it's some simple lightweight monitoring because I think most everyone that accesses this will do it for the right purposes, okay? And so I think that you don't have to be too rigid um, and that, uh, that you can do that. I have thought about more rigid ways, but I think you can do it fairly loosely. Yes. Right. Yes. So, in fact, so, agreed. If you will. Yes. I think that's a good question. That, in fact, luckily we've gotten fair. We, 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 this isn't overly rigid, but you can imagine about the same problem with other folks that are very apprehensive about giving you the data. How can you have this another layer in the same center? Because, in fact, this may be what about books published in the future? How can you get it where publishers put it in? and feel that it's secured because people can only get it to a series of APIs? I think that's a good question. Yeah. So um, we're going to make this the last question, but All Dan's right. um, joining us at the reception later. I, so what, is the reception 5.30 to yes, 6.30? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, lots of your books will have uh, pictures and sketches and so on. So are you already in your scanning considering storing them for subsequent querying? Yeah. So in fact, and, and I assume that you're, you're um, relating to the fact that, that, for those who don't know, the settlement doesn't give us authorization to display, hold on, to display images or, or drawings that aren't by the same copyright holder of the book. Okay, so it's the same copyright. So most of you that have written books, I suspect, you put your figures and images and all that in there. Okay, so in fact, this isn't an issue because, in fact, you, I know I, as a computer scientist, I build my own graphs and images and all that. For some of you that might license pictures, then the image holders were not class members. Now, we're still scanning the whole thing, okay, because we still think it's fair use. But we only get authorization from the class, and the class doesn't include those image holders that aren't the, the authors of the books. I mean, for most of computer science, I don't think this is a, a huge issue. Um, but in other cases, I think it does. So um, although we're hoping to, to solve that. 
Um, let me mention a couple things to this group that, that um, I didn't mention that I thought of. First of all, um, for those of you that you know have out of print books, okay, um, Google is very supportive of, well, actually, even for in print books, but usually your publisher might have a problem here, um, for distributing those for free to the extent that's what you want to do. Okay, and in fact, we're going to announce this soon. We're even going to allow distribution through a CC license if that's what people want to do. Don't go and, you know, spread that around. But we've talked about it. We've talked, we're coming up. So any of you that have books that maybe we've scanned that you're like, oh, I own the rights. I'd like to distribute through CC. Google would be supportive of that. And for those of you, you know, that have out of print books that, you know, do or don't own the rights, you know, under the settlement, you can you don't have to sell them. You can give them away for zero, which, you know, I know. If I had an out-of-print book, I don't have an in-print book either, um, uh, I would, that's what I would do. By the way, dissertations, okay, are in many cases probably included. So, in fact, actually everyone in this room is a class member. And it creates certain opportunities with your schools about how to open up some of these dissertations. Because I think many um, uh, students would say, yes, please let my dissertation be fully searchable and broadly on the web and accessible in an integrated fashion. Okay, so that's one thing for y'all to think about, um, you know, that in terms of your schools, feel free to reach out to me. Um, uh, so that was one point. For those of you, so let me mention my email address is dclancy at Google. Feel free to reach out to me if you have questions, if you don't come tonight, um, you have questions about the settlement, et cetera, et cetera. One of the things that's happening, as y'all know, there's been a fair amount of press about the settlement. Um, having talked to lots of people, I find, you know, the vast majority of people, when they understand the agreement, gets very excited, okay, because they realize the potential of unlocking this, okay. There are folks that have some concerns. There is a very vocal, what I think is a small minority, as people become informed. Um, Ed Feigenbaum is going to be is putting together a letter from a number of scholars to kind of make a statement of support for the agreement. And for any of you that are interested in learning more or participating in that, reach out to me because, you know, and some of you Ed may reach out to directly because it's the type of thing where if this doesn't happen, um, you know, we probably are left where people are watch looking snippets, okay, because um, that's, we assume we would win the case, but even if we win the case, all you would do is get three little snippets of much of this stuff. And while for computer science, much of the stuff you want to read is actually still in print, in fact, some of the out of print stuff, maybe it's not the best thing to read. Um, but I do think there's a societal and a, you know, in terms of comprehensive, there's a lot of useful value in making sure this content is accessible. Okay. So feel free to reach out to me. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.